Back to the situation in Brockton where there have been confrontations tonight between protesters, Brockton police, state troopers and the National Guard on the ground there on Commercial Street in Brockton as well. I want to bring in former Boston Police Commissioner and current WBZ security analyst Ed Davis to talk more about this. Ed, thanks for being with us tonight. What do you make of what you're seeing in Brockton right now? Hi, Lisa. I, this is uh, this is troubling in that uh, it is starting to break out across the the state now. Uh, so you've got to wonder if this is a homegrown situation in Brockton, or if some of the um, agitators that we saw in Boston Sunday night uh, have decided to uh, move this from place to place. There are a number of demonstrations that are being planned across the state, and um, it's it'll be troubling if these are. Uh, you know, the, the people that are moving from city to city. This is a horrendous situation. Uh, people are standing up for something that uh, should not have happened. Uh, this police officer has to be prosecuted to the full extent of the law, as well as the other officers that allowed this to happen. Um, but a peaceful protest and standing up for Mr. Floyd is one thing. Breaking windows, throwing... Uh, uh, Molotov cocktails, as we've seen in some cities. Um, these individuals that are firing fireworks at the police officers in Brockton tonight, they came equipped to do this. You, you don't just pick a, a bag of fireworks up from the sidewalk. There are people planning, they're equipping themselves, and they're injuring police officers. Seven in Boston the other night. The injury of innocent police officers is. Uh, it, it is a travesty. It, it is a, a, a terrible uh, thing to have happen uh, to, to these officers and their families. And, and I think we just have to calm down and make sure that we affect change, but not injure people inappropriately. And Ed, as we watch what unfolds on Commercial Street in Brockton, the confrontation there between the protesters and police, what are what goes into the decision from police about whether they advance on these protesters or just try to hold their ground there? Because based on what I can tell, they're sort of keeping the protesters from getting to the police building. So what goes into that decision about do we confront, do we try to push up the street, or do we just stay where we are and try to protect the building? Uh, well, there's a lot of things that go into the, uh, the, the calculus on when you move and how you move. First of all, you want to use as little force as possible. So the taunting and the, uh, you know, the, the, the trying to get the officers to react so people can get it on camera, uh, the officers understand that game and they're, they're not getting uh, pulled into it. Uh, but uh, they try to keep a distance between the crowd and the police line uh, so that um, anybody that throws a projectile, the projectile will fall in that open space. So that's that's really what they want. When you see the crowd edging forward, um, there might be some very legitimate protesters even on that line that are moving forward, but they're being used by people in the back who are using them for cover. And uh, those are the people that launch the projectiles. So the closer that they get to the offices, the more likely the offices will be injured by flying debris. At that point in time, the offices have to do something. They have to disperse the crowd. They could break the line and go in and, and, and have a skirmish line and, and, you know, sort of have hand-to-hand -hand combat there. But that is ugly, and they, nobody wants to have that, that, that visual. So they'll use pepper spray. They'll use um, tear gas, in this case, uh, from what I understand, in Brockton tonight, uh, as well as other uh, non-lethal munitions to, to push uh, the crowd away. And usually, if they do that, the crowd starts to break up and, and move to another location. Then they move to another location. So it's a game of cat and mouse over the course of the evening. Yeah, and I'm just curious, because we are seeing these protests now in multiple cities just in Massachusetts, how much communication takes place between police departments um, and with the state police? There's constant communication. There are two main um, avenues to, to pursue uh, tactical and strategic information in these situations. Uh, the first is um, in the Boston area, the Boston Regional Intelligence Center, the BRIC. Um, they are one of the 74 fusion centers that are located in the country. Uh, they are funded through uh, the uh, federal government. And uh, they have a team of uh, analysts and detectives assigned there that do nothing but synthesize information from the street. Uh, 
and from the uh, the flow, the, infra, the intelligence stream that comes from the federal government and other state governments. So there's a constant conversation going on there. Every morning at 10 o'clock, uh, the UAC uh, uh, cities and towns, which are the contiguous communities to Boston, they uh, they have a conversation. Uh, they share information on crime that's occurring. But in this particular case, they're looking very hard at these individuals that are traveling from place to place, out-of-state license plates, indications that people are communicating with each other and causing this to happen. The other level is at the state level uh, with the State Fusion Center. And uh, th that's a similar operation, but that handles all of the other cities and towns in the state. The State Fusion Center and the BRIC talk to each other uh, literally minute by minute in a situation like this. So the information flow is very good. Ed, tonight we saw in front of Boston Police Headquarters in Roxbury, some of the protesters were there, and they called on the officers to kneel with them in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement and everything that has happened with George Floyd and, and, and to talk about policing in this country over the last week and a half. Um, some of those officers kneeled and held their fist up in a show of solidarity. What did you make of that? I think it's tremendous that the officers are uh, showing uh, their human side, their compassion, the fact that they are members of, of the minority community, a lot of them. Uh, I believe I saw Officer Kim Tavares there, uh, one of my best officers when I was a commissioner, uh, very connected to the community um, through her work on the street and also her her uh, performances, she's, she's a, a, a renowned singer. Um, it's people like that. And, and the relationships that police officers form one on one that's going to get us through this. Um, it, it's happened before. Uh, this is similar to the way the troops were uh, treated in the 1970s coming back from the Vietnam War. I was a kid, but I remember that. Unfortunately, we're going through the same type of public uh, distrust. We need to rebuild that trust. And that right there, Ed, that kneeling, it, it is a, it's a symbol of respect from the officers to the crowd that is engaging um, in a passionate form of democracy. And we heard the crowd showing the respect right back. And there's no question that that is heartening. Um, you know, it's, it's, everyone is recognizing this moment, this, this need for racial justice in this country, this end to systemic racism. And you heard the protesters early tonight essentially making a plea for peace. George Floyd's brother was saying, whatever you do, and no one can feel as bad as I do, don't commit acts of violence in the name of, of making change. At what point do you see this turning so that the overwhelming swell is with the peaceful protesters. In other words, do the peaceful protesters, by virtue of their numbers and their message, have the power to essentially drown out the bad actors? They do, Lisa, and that's really the most important component of this. Um, the FBI has put a plea out today for a video of uh, looting incidents and, and arsons that occurred in the city. The, the, the Boston police detectives, the uh, state police detectives, everybody's working to try to identify these agitators and put them in jail. And that does a little bit, but the big, the big factor, the, the, the issue that will sway this is the community's acceptance or disdain for this activity. And as soon as the agitators in the crowd um, are identified, and people who are the good people, the vast majority of people at this at these marches, by the way, good people want to put, get their point out, don't want, want to see anybody hurt. When, when the good people start to realize that they're being used by some of these agitators to forward an agenda of anarchy, um, they will stand up and stop it from happening. And, and that's really what we have to hope for nationwide. Ed, you were the Boston police commissioner and a police officer for many years as well. Do, do you think we have a problem with policing in America? Yes, uh, we do. Um, most police officers are extremely dedicated and committed to their, to their work and, and very literally uh, risk their lives uh, when they perform their duties. Um, there's, there's, there's a couple of problems, uh, and, and one is uh, it's a cultural problem. People say, well, th they need more training. Tremont, right? They don't really need more training. It's, it's the, uh, 
it's the way um, the culture operates inside the department. And it, and it starts in the police academy. Um, I've been a big advocate for um, community policing and communication training uh, in police academies. There are other people that are advocates for a military style of police. And after 9-11, they got a lot of uh, attention. So all the work that we did in the uh, in the 1990s to move the community policing initiative forward was sidetracked to, to a more military model. That's a problem. It, it's not, it, it, these are good people that work in a system uh, that, um, that isn't as good as it could be um, because you have to show the difference between civil policing and military control. And, and you're seeing that today played out in city after city in the United States. So the initial training has to change. And then we have to hold officers uh, like this guy that was indicted in, in Minneapolis. He's got 18 former complaints. He's been involved in three shootings. There are certain people that just should not be on the police department. And, and there's a lot of reasons why they can't be removed. They really need to, to forward legislation uh, to make that system more visible, more accountable, and uh, and have the community involved in it. Uh, and, 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 and really, uh, the, the, the poor cops that are out there right now, um, friends of mine, relatives of mine that are out there on the street right now, are being vilified because of the actions of four people in the Midwest. Um, has there been a problem? Yes, there has. But this blew up because a bad cop was left on the job and did what you could almost see him, you could almost see it coming. And that, that those two things, the, the initial training and then the ability to uh, remove a person who's, who doesn't deserve to be a police officer from the ranks uh, will make cops safer, will make citizens safer. We've got to do something. Yeah, and your heart breaks for the men and women on the force who invest themselves in their communities, who want to become a trusted resource. Uh, knowing what you know, Ed, about the culture, it really does feel that we're at a tipping point right now. Are you hopeful that with the right attention, with, with the right determination and plan, that we in this country can change that culture? Yes, and, and, and you know, the, the, the frustrating thing about uh, government is that they only react when there's a crisis, it seems. Uh, but there is a crisis, and, and so you can be pretty sure that there will be significant change that comes out of this crisis. And the, and the great news is, you mentioned the plan. The plan is done. The plan was put together by Chuck Ramsey, who was a police chief in, 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 uh, in D.C., along with Laurie Robinson, who was an assistant attorney general. After Ferguson, they had a nationwide study called uh, Policing in the 21st Century. They, they studied it for several years. They put a plan together. It's, it's literally a guidebook to improve on some of the problems that we're seeing here. We just need some national direction to implement that process. It's done. The plan is there. If you do those three things, um, change the, the initial training so that it's more community oriented, um, put systems in place for accountability, and then finally follow the plan that's already published, um, this, this will be a different nation. Ed, we want you to stay with us if you can uh, for just a few moments. We are going to go back out live to some of our reporters.